Good evening and welcome to all of you in the name of our gracious Lord who has given us his own eternal word so that we might know him and be saved. This evening we are blessed to gather together at his feet and hear our Lord's word as he once again comes to us with his encouragement. We worship the Lord this evening by following the order of service as printed in your service folder. We will begin our worship by singing, Almighty God, your word is cast. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and to bring forth fruits in faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our scripture readings this evening remind each one of us of how richly and wonderfully blessed we are because our God has given us his word. His word is life because in his word, the Lord reveals himself to us. For the apostle Paul proclaiming the word was everything. We are reminded of that in Acts chapter 18. We read, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. 
There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. Because he had the same occupation, he stayed and worked with them, for they were tent makers by trade. Every Sabbath, he led a discussion in the synagogue, trying to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was entirely devoted to preaching the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they opposed Paul and slandered him, he shook out his clothes and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. He left that place and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the synagogue leader, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, but keep on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will lay a hand on you to harm you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. This is God's word. Let us now consider how blessed we are as we listen to the words of Psalm 65. The earth is full of the goodness of God, the goodness of our God. Praise awaits you, O God. You call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. The earth is full of the goodness of God, the goodness of our God. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the desert overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The earth is full of the goodness of God, the goodness of our God. Please rise. The Gospel reading is recorded in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. We read, That same day Jesus left the house and was sitting by the sea. A large crowd gathered around him, so he stepped into a boat and sat down, while all the people stood on the shore. He told them many things in parables saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, 
and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. Immediately, the seed sprang up, because the soil was not deep. But when the sun rose, the seed was scorched. Because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew, grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on good ground and produced grain, some 100 times, some 60, and some 30 times more than was sown. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So listen carefully to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what had been sown in his heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. The seed that was sown on rocky ground is the person who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, he is not deeply rooted and it does not endure. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed that was sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but the worry of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it produces no fruit. But the seed that was sown on the good ground is the one who continues to hear and understand the word. Indeed, he continues to produce fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times more than was sown. This is the gospel of our Lord. The word of God has taken root in our hearts and in our lives, and let us now confess that faith that God has given us as we speak the Apostles' Creed found on page 5. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now pause to listen to the words of the hymn, Seek Ye First. Ye may be seated. You may be seated.
Please rise. Let us rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh, who has given us his own word, that we might know him and be saved. Amen. The portion of God's word for our attention is the word of the Lord given to us through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. We read, Just as the rain and the snow come down from the sky and do not return there unless they first water the earth, make it give birth, and cause it to sprout, so that it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In the same way, my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty. Rather, it will accomplish whatever I please, and it will succeed in the purpose for which I sent it. Yes. You will go out with joy, and in peace you will be carried along. The mountains and the hills will break out in shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of thorns, a fir tree will grow up. Instead of briars, a myrtle tree will grow up. This will make a name for the Lord. It will serve as an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. This is God's word. In the name of our loving Lord God who has made us his, who has brought us to him through faith, in Jesus our Savior, my dear fellow redeemed, triumphant, brothers and sisters in Christ. Just think for a moment of how much planning we do before we plant something. For those of us who are farmers, you don't need me to tell you how much planning you do every time before the planting season and the long hours and the purchase of the seed and the fertilizer and the time set aside in the schedule to get the seed into the ground. But we plan also, we have a farming strategy when we purchase those flowers and those plants to landscape our lawn. We put real thought into what we're going to do this year before we plant our garden. And many people have spent a lot of time and energy to plan out woodland, to plan how things are going to be planted where they live or where they work, and they hire out help and advice and people who are experts so that they have a farming strategy, a farming plan. As we put that plan together, we do so because we want to make the best of a situation and end up with the best harvest we can possibly have. We want our lawn, our lawn to look beautiful with the flowers blooming and the shrubs thriving. When we plant for the planting season, we want to harvest so that we're able to make a living and enjoy the fruit of our labor. When we plant that garden, we look forward to this time of the year when the tomatoes are starting to ripen and we can enjoy the vegetables that are coming from our work of planting. And yet as we do that, we understand it doesn't always work out as planned because there are certain variables like weather, soil quality, having enough time to get everything done that we need to get done. So it doesn't always work out as we have planned. But this evening, as we listen to God's word, we are going to be listening to, as we have heard and reflecting on tonight, the Lord's farming plan. And as the Lord 
presents to us his own farming strategy, his never fails. His never falls short. And we are the recipients of that plan that he carries out to perfection. As we consider the Lord's farming plan tonight, I encourage each one of us to appreciate the total certainty of it. And then to rejoice in the harvest that he brings. There are challenges that we face when we set up a farming plan. We are at the mercy of the weather, aren't we? If it's a wet time of the year when we want to be in the field, if it's too wet, we can't be in the field. And as much as we want to be there planting, we need to wait and wait, and sometimes the waiting can be very long. When we plant that garden, we're at the mercy of the weather. If we don't get enough rain after we planted it, we watch those things that we planted not really growing the way that we had hoped. And the flowers, if it's too hot or too dry, it seems that they just don't last too long. And so with all the planning that we do and that we have, it doesn't always work out. And sometimes to make it work, there are literally very long hours. A lot of expense might go into making it work. And there is the sore back and the achy knees from putting out all that energy and that time into the planting. But as we consider the Lord's farming plan, listen to how it is presented by his prophet. Just as the rain and the snow come down from the sky and do not return there unless they first water the earth and make it give birth and cause it to sprout, so that it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In the same way, my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty. Rather, it will accomplish what I please and will succeed in the purpose for which I sent it. The Lord's farming plan never fails. It always works. It always goes exactly the way God wants it to go. And it always accomplishes exactly what he wants it to accomplish. It breaks through the infertile soil of sin where nothing can grow. It penetrates the most hardened heart that is rock hard and makes it alive. It penetrates the dead, lifeless soil where nothing can grow from the sinful heart and the sinful mind. And life comes forth and comes out of it by the power of God. Here in Isaiah chapter 55, the prophet is speaking a beautiful section of pure gospel. Earlier in chapter 55, he talks about the power of being saved and the triumph of being saved. And now here he is talking about why that salvation has happened. Because the word of God has rained down upon us. And just as when the water falls from the sky and it causes everything that it lands on to become wet, so the word of God, when it falls on people, always makes them wet by accomplishing what God wants it to accomplish. His perfect farming plan. When we plant our crops, we expect them to grow, don't we? That's why we plant them. That's why we put out that hard work and those long hours. When we plant the garden, we expect it to grow. We anticipate it. When we plant it in May or whenever we plant it, we fully anticipate that by the time we get to July, we will see things starting to happen. When we plant those flowers, we plan for them to grow. If we planned for the things we plant not to grow, we wouldn't waste our time planting, would we? The very fact that we're doing it putting in that energy, that effort, that planning, reminds us we anticipate growth. 
We anticipate a crop. Do we sometimes forget that with the word of God? Are we sometimes more confident that the beans are going to grow than that the word of God is going to change that sinful heart? Do we sometimes anticipate the flowers to grow more than we anticipate the word of God changing someone who doesn't believe in Jesus? Or bringing us the encouragement that we need when we are hurting? Isn't it a very real temptation to underestimate the power of the Word of God? And to forget that every time it is sown, every time it goes out, every time it falls from the heavens, every time it is read and proclaimed, blessings are happening. Because it is God's own Word. And it is His own power. Think of the blessings we have in the Word of God. You know your Savior, Jesus. You know the enduring love of God for you. You know beyond any doubt that your sin has been washed away. We know by the grace of God that we are triumphant even while we suffer and that we have eternal victory because Jesus lives. We know these truths that are eternal, life-changing, and essential and we know them because God has revealed it to us in his word. And that's what gives us confidence. When the word is read, when it is heard as we are doing right now, when we are sharing it with people we love, there is no doubt about its power. Because to doubt the power of the word of God is to doubt the power of God. And God is all powerful and perfect in love, which is why he has given us his word. And then he tells us, get ready for a harvest. Listen to the harvest that he proclaims. Yes, you will go out with joy. And in peace, you will be carried along. The mountains and the hills will break out in shouts of joy before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of thorns... A fir tree will grow up. Instead of briars, a myrtle tree will grow up. This will make a name for the Lord. It will serve as an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. That harvest is right now. That harvest is the fact that we know what Christ Jesus has done for us and we have the eternal joy of the gospel. That harvest is miraculous as Isaiah is talking about it. The briars and the thorns are going to be turned into beautiful bushes and tall stately trees, not shriveled up lifeless shrubs, but a beautiful gardening display of God's splendor of eternal victory. And it is miraculous because from our own lifeless, sinful hearts, there is life. From our own ignorance of not knowing our Savior, we know the wonders of his love as he has revealed the mystery of the gospel. That beautiful harvest is already a reality, and the harvest will be enjoyed to the full someday when we are in heaven. The harvest will be lived to the full when we are taken out of this world and to our eternal rest with our God. People put a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of expense into their farming plan, into their farming strategy, researching the perfect seed to plant, contracting for the right fertilizer and the timing for everything to happen, setting aside the time to do the planting, purchasing that equipment to plant it well. There's a lot of work and planning that goes into it. And there's a reason for that. It's important. It's important because we need to eat. We want our lawns to be beautiful. We want a nice garden. We want the woodlands to be healthy and fertile. 
And if we're going to put out that much time and energy into a farming plan, how much more the Word of God deserves that time and that energy? Because the Word of God is eternal life. And God's farming plan is for us to be recipients of that grace as he rains his word down upon us and blesses us. And his ongoing plan is that those who know him and believe in him, which is what we all are by his grace, are sowing that seed, scattering it, planting it, by telling others that our God is good and Jesus is the Savior of all. That's our Lord's farming plan, and we rejoice in it. Amen. Now may the peace of our God, which transcends all understanding, guard you and keep you in his care today and always. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, light of the world and saving strength of your people, we thank you for the gift of your word, implanted in the hearts of your people, so that set free from the power of Satan and the fear of death, we may live to serve and honor you. Pour out your spirit upon us, that we may grow richly in divine knowledge and spiritual understanding. Bless the proclamation of your word everywhere so that hearts may be turned from the darkness of spiritual ignorance, falsehood, and despair to the light of knowledge, truth, and life. Be with our missionaries in our own and distant lands. Protect them, encourage them, and crown their labors with success. Let your word shine in our homes that parents and children may dwell together in love and serve one another in kindness and humility. Watch over the sick, the sorrowing, the anxious, and the weary. Preserve those who are in any danger of body or soul. Supply us by the grace of Jesus and with the Spirit's power that we may always be comforted by your truth and sustained by your love. Lord God, as we face challenges at this time in the proclamation of your word, bless us so that we continue to proclaim it with the blessings you have given to us. Bless our Lutheran elementary schools, our high schools, and our colleges as we plan to move forward into a new school year so that your word might continue to be taught. Bless all of us who are hearing your word so that we might constantly live in the power of the joy of your gospel and the power to serve you in all that we say and do. For these and all the other things that you know we need, we confidently ask in the name of him who gave himself for us that we might live through him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us close our service by singing the closing hymn on what has now been sown. You may be seated.
Good evening again and welcome to each and every one of you. It is good to see you. It is good to gather together in God's house and be refreshed by his saving word. Please take the time to read through the announcements in the bulletin. You'll notice um, the announcements for the Sunday, August 9th, the outdoor services. When again, keep in mind, we will be celebrating Easter at those services, also with a children's Easter, and that will be followed by our ice cream social with things being done different from the way they had normally been done in the past, but we will still be having our ice cream social. The day before that, August 8th, will be our one-day vacation Bible school. Please plan on that. This Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., that's July 28th, will be our quarterly voters meeting. And then you'll see the rest of the announcements in the bulletin are many opportunities to serve the Lord and grow together as God's people. We also welcome our guests and our visitors who are with us this evening and would appreciate it if you would please sign our guest book, which is in the entryway before you leave. And I will be wandering around out there and greet you out there. And please take the time to greet one another when you have the opportunity.